So did you have any questions about that last section when we were doing the very short chin resig practice with the five colored not light coming down? <clears throat> or um, about the last yoga with signs meditations or the yoga without sign? I think what it reminded me of was just the joy of simplicity, you know, just the, the pared down words. Um, you know, I, I do wonder if you, you might have any suggestions for a, a fairly literal non-poetic person on how to kind of work with the elaborations and masses of offerings and, you know, just how in some of the commentaries, you know, Tara, kind of purified 100,000 people in, in one click of the finger or whatever. You know, this kind of, I really appreciate that perhaps they're metaphors, but they can, for, for me personally, sometimes feel um, over elaborate and exaggerated. So yeah, any suggestions, welcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I always feel like elaboration in Buddhism is, to help us come back to the simple and the simple invites elaboration and that it's like somehow an invitation for flexibility you know so it's kind of like when you were four years old it occurred to you that love is a good thing <laughs> you know or like your grandmother taught you love is important and you're like yeah it is you know and now everything is just variations on a theme and that those deep knowings you had as a child are not significantly different than the deep knowings you have as an adult, but you need more information to anchor them and to deepen them and to make them richer. But you're coming back to the same conclusion as when you were a little kid, which is we cannot survive without love. May there be love in me. May I give love out of me. May I receive it. May I give it. The whole point of it is this, that I know, but now I need to understand what stands in opposition to it. Okay, attachment, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these millions of things that part of us kind of knew before they were trapped into lists and definitions and words, we already kind of knew viscerally or intuitively or from past lives or whatever, we knew it already. But to anchor it in words and to have a systematized process to really challenge ourselves about what blocks the heart and to invite ourselves to open it wider. It enriches it and then, and then you kind of let go of the elaboration for a while and just come back to simple truths I've always known. And then for a while, simple truths you've always known can get a little stale or like lose some flexibility or get kind of flavors of complacency or something and then you need to open it back up again and elaborate again and get lists and definitions and stories and poetry and images and kind of burst it back into life again and then return to the simplicity with richness again so i somehow feel like our practice is like that where it goes simple and huge and simple and huge and that you're not doing anything radically different than you've ever done. You're just finding more ways to reinforce those basic truths. So these stories, I feel like for some people, you know, uh, I don't know, allegory or analogies or metaphors or poetry or stories convey some sort of richness in the point of them, not the actual story of them. The point of them conveys something very important. Like did Chen Rezig really make a promise that if he lost his bodhicitta, he'd break into a thousand pieces if he ever lost his bodhicitta. And then the demon said, give me your arm. And Chen Rezig said, sure, and handed him his arm. And then the demon said, you handed it to me with your left arm. That is so rude. And Chen Rezig was like, oh my God, sentient things are impossible. Lost his bodhicitta, burst into a thousand pieces. Did that happen? I don't care, <laughs> right? Like I kind of, I don't care if it happened or not. It conveys something very important to me about my daily life and my expectations and how conditional I can be and how much I expect appreciation or applause for doing the right thing. I don't want to get lost in whether it's true or not. I want to get to the, what's the point of it. Do you know what I mean? And so some people do take them very literally and it makes them very happy to do so. And some people think that is impossible. Why would I even listen to it? 
and they miss the magic of whatever is woven within it. And so I feel like somehow we need to strike some sort of resonance of regardless, what's the point? In terms of the study, you know, I think that sometimes it can get a little dry and you think, must we split so many hairs? Must we? <laughs> right? And I think that the answer is sometimes, not always. You know, it, it feels like the same lesson keeps coming back to us again and again, which is how to stay in that flow state of not too tight, not too loose. What's going to keep pacing and momentum and energy and vitality? And sometimes it's staying very simple and sometimes it's bringing in elaboration. And it really doesn't even matter which it is. It, the question is, am I staying in that flow and that momentum with my practice or am I getting stagnated? I don't, wanna, I don't want it to ever sound like pressure. Like you need to remember all of these things. It's more like an invitation for a uh, inner conversation. What do these lists make me think of? Or what references do I make? Or how do I bring them home to myself? And when you have that really relaxed, happy mind about it, of course you wind up remembering tons. And when you have a tight mind that says, oh no, a list, another list, I must remember. Then of course you forget everything, you know? So it's, it's just keep a really curious, happy mind of, huh, that's huh, interesting. <laughs> I, I think when, when, um, from Wendy's comment, I, I think I'm the other way. I want more elaboration. I kind of really, really want more detail and elaboration. <laughs> and, uh, and simplicity is, is great, but I, I just think I want more, I want more of this, <laughs> far more detail. <laughs> Well, it's a good reflection because, you know, that's, we need different things at different points in our practice, you know, and I, uh, it's like neither is good or bad in and of themselves. The question is what's keeping you sparky, you know, and inspired and uplifted. Yeah. And yeah. so it's really just that like deep self-awareness and there is no transformation without self-awareness is there. Yeah. That's, you know, that's what it all boils down to. Our practice is inner work, our inner world, our inner conversation. So if you don't know how you're responding to practice or information, then how can it possibly integrate? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it made me think a bit about um, Mahamudra teachings and sort of, you know, arising, abiding and ceasing. And for me, that's something that's helpful because um, I can have a tendency to sort of get a bit tight um so for me that's helpful and I also really appreciate what you said yesterday about teachers of tantra tending to either be quite experiential or tending to go with you know like full tenets and whatnot and I think I found it a bit difficult finding a way around and sort of through that really but um no I, I found that really helpful you know as you said about the energy and the vitality um, and with that particular practice, or well, there's a number of practice where there's a sort of like Dhyani Buddhas and rainbow light. I just sort of see it as like this sort of flowing rainbow light and then coming in and through and then just sort of see it as coming through and going out. And so for me, it works to keep it reasonably simple, usually. Um, and I don't know, from my limited experience of Saddam as the different ones I've done, it sort of feels like they're all reflecting of each other and the components yeah. are pretty similar um so yeah i mean it, it's sometimes like if if suddenly i don't know we had we were thrust into a classroom and we had to be the substitute teacher for a bunch of teenagers okay so say we were suddenly thrust into the classroom we're the substitute teacher none of the kids know us um and we're kind of put on the spot okay and that's kind of like what you would be bringing is all of your life skills, all of your life experience to be able to address the needs of various students. So some kids would need you to be cool and upbeat and flexible and jokey. And some of the kids would need you to be firm and decisive and disciplined in a gentle way, right? And some of them would need you to speak softly and slowly and gently. And it doesn't mean that you're three different people those are just three different capabilities you can bring forth given the needs of various children. 
And because we're adults and we've lived in the world and we were children once ourselves, we have an idea about what would work for different dispositions. So I always imagine that the Buddhas are like an amazingly elevated version of that where they can be anything, but they're choosing different aspects to suit our minds. You know, and that the, the guru, for example, is choosing different dispositions to suit our minds. Like my own teacher, for some people, he is very blunt and brusque and makes fun of them and teases them and they love it. It bounces right off of them. And for others, he's like sweet grandpa and he's like, oh, you're very smart, you know, right? And he's just totally cuddly bear grandpa aspect. And for others, he roars at them, you know? And for all of us, it feels like love. But if he took one aspect and put it in a different person, it wouldn't resonate the right way. So a lot of this development and this flexibility and being and doing different practices, I feel like is just getting all of these tools in our developmental tool belt so that we can really meet people with strategies that work for them. Because it's just like some days we want simplicity, some days we want elaboration. That's important knowledge for us. What do others need from me, from what I'm able to give them today in this moment? What's going to bring out the chenrezignness in them? You know, and so you're listening deeply for other people's wisdom and asking yourself, how can I meet their wisdom in such a way that it invites it even further out? You know, and your chenrezig speaks to their chenrezig and it becomes a chenrezig extravaganza. Right? So, so it's like kind of take what you already know about life and then the Dharma is elevating and deepening or expanding, however you want to picture it. It was a question about um, bringing in your own creativity to these visualizations. Um, we can make, you know, uh, my mind tends to add or subtract, um, divide, <laughs> multiply, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean, so that's okay to do, obviously, right? I mean, that's what you basically what you're saying, because even as one individual, we can change how we feel from. And, and and what we need in from one day to the next um yeah I, I think that what we have to remember is how hard it is to have any kind of discipline but the power of continuity so how do you marry up i need to be flexible and adjust to my energy level day to day while keeping a continuous thread while not reinventing the wheel right so you have mm -hmm. kind of like the basic structure of your practice mm -hmm. and, and there's the points that you always hit right refuge bodhicitta essential cannot give up you cannot uh, skip that part right refuge bodhicitta you know and then other parts okay offerings i don't have to do the giant offerings but i need to at least do a offering at that point you know so you're making sure you're hitting all the main points but on days that you're tired or you need more simplicity you do it more simply days that you've got more spaciousness and expansiveness you do it more detailed but every day you're doing that practice so it's that delicate dance of making it your own without reinventing the wheel being disciplined but still being really flexible and it's not like you're being disciplined because you're like a bad girl who should be punished it's you're being disciplined because there is power in repetition so you give yourself the best chance for success with repetition. And nobody is watching except the Buddhas who love you regardless. But what you're trying to do is, is just keep the power of continuity because otherwise what winds up happening is we'll do a big burst of practice and then nothing. And then a big burst and then nothing. And those big bursts are meaningful and they do help us, but they start to become akin to kind of peak experiences in life that we don't pull into the rest of our life. And then we kind of miss the momentum that we could use from them. You know, so you have a big intensive something, a group retreat or a llama visit or whatever. Then you ask yourself at the end of those days, how do I pull a thread of that into my daily life? In the simplest you know, most personal of ways, but to not lose the fact that you were lifted a bit more by those events.
Um, I'd just like to ask you about the, the booklets and the sadhana um, and how you move from the booklet possibly to the proper meditation because I read the sadhana and then I feel I'm not doing the meditation. Mm. And then sometimes then I'll think, well, I'll do it without and I do the refuge and everything and then I get to a panic almost. It's like, <laughs> where's the book? I can't do it. Or how how would you advise us to use the booklet? You know, there's a lot of benefits to memorizing your sadhanas, but I think that I wouldn't make it a special plan to memorize it. I think with a relaxed mind, you memorize much more easily anyway. What, what I wind up doing is if it's a new practice, you know, like I've just gotten a new empowerment and I have a new sadhana that I'm getting used to, I just do it as written for a few days until I'm used to the words. And then I start consciously pressing pause, you know, even though it's a text, it's not a recording, right? But like mm -hmm. I get to an obvious section transition and I just stop and I say, okay, I'm going to meditate for three minutes on refuge meditate for three minutes on refuge, finish. Okay, four immeasurable thoughts. I can do some tonglen at the end of four immeasurable thoughts. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, four immeasurable thoughts, pause, tonglen. Yeah, and then, you know, you, you just sort of are consciously choosing natural transitions to pause and give depth and time. And it works to, you know, kind of look at your sadhana and, and think about it ahead of time, particularly to marry it up with any commentary you might have had. Yeah, and just kind of um, say we're doing that practice we just did. It might be that when you're visualizing the body of Chenrezig above the crown of your head, you take a minute to really spend time what's called minding the symbolism. And you think, okay, so he's got four arms. They represent the four immeasurable thoughts. The jewel represents compassion. The mala beads recite the mantra. The lotus represents wisdom. The three principal aspects of the past are the lotus sun and moon that he sits on, blah, 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 right? And you're just kind of like remembering everything you know about the symbolism of Chenrezig while holding the image. And then just stay with the image without analysis and see if it's a bit brighter or clearer. Doesn't matter if it is or isn't, just try gently. And then add the nectar flowing down. You know, so it's just conscious pauses to give it more, more connection. Thank you. That's Does that helpful. help? Is that your question? Yes, it is. And I think that's very helpful. Thank you very much. On that, on that note, Claire, this is what I sometimes do and I hope it's not a bad thing. Um, when I've bought... <laughs> Yeah, from the FPMT. I print it out and then I get a big A4 book and I cut out the first section and paste it on top. And then underneath I write things that I've heard in commentaries, which obviously are so much more vivid when you hear the words from a human in their in in your own cultural context or kind of weaving in. Um, and I stick that underneath. Um, and then sometimes I leave a few pages because I love reading commentaries as well. So then I might stick in the right bit from the commentary, but it actually very quickly gets too full up because I love reading commentaries. Um, so in general, I just write a kind of praise of the most vivid words that I've heard or what I'm meant to be doing. Um, and then I paste in the next bit. So I've got refuge and I'll write down whatever I've heard about that but quite short, otherwise it gets way too long. And then turn the page and maybe on the next right-hand page, put the bodhicitta thing and so on and so forth. So I hope it's not terrible to be cutting up Dharma things, but I think my intention probably overrides any um, <laughs> accidental. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, no, it's a great idea. It's a great idea. And, you know, little scribbled notes in the margin, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to really be active with your practice. Yeah, active engagement with your practice, not kind of passive. Sometimes, um, sometimes in group practices, it depends on your leader, but you'll just read the sadhana like at rocket speed, just like rabbiting through it, like to get through it or like to get to the mantra or something. And sometimes that's just necessary because of the timetable or it's because the emphasis of the retreat is on the mantra accumulation but it doesn't mean you have to do it that way slow down you know and just give it connection time 
And then some parts, it might be you can read them quite quickly because they're so familiar that you connect because of familiarity. You know, so it's not like there's a benefit or disadvantage in slowness or fastness in and of itself. It's about personalizing it. And then when you're in group practice, there is so many correct ways that you say right now in group practice, now I'm shifting gears to benefiting from the group energy. And I'm going to go the speed of the chant leader and the tune of the chant leader. And it doesn't matter if the chant leader does it differently than the way I do it. Right now, the practice is about using the group energy and the community connection. So you kind of shift gears very consciously than when you're in that group space and you get something different. You get a new nuance from it, doing it in that way. So sometimes that can be uh, jolting if you've been doing a practice a, a long time and then you're in a group and they do it differently to how you learned it. But it's again, keeping that mind that is just really flexible and creative as well as collaborative and just kind of like goes with it and sees what happens, like really open and curious. There's kind of two modalities, group practice and solo practice. But solo practice, please make it your own in terms of speed and depth and weaving in commentaries and all that kind of stuff. And, and even making notes of, I always get stuck on this line. I must ask my teacher about this line, you know, or ask the senior students if they know a good commentary on it. You know, really be proactive with your practice.